Concerning Him, an Emmaus podcast is a ministry of Emmaus Bible College. Concerning Him seeks to enrich Christians around the globe by educating and equipping them through various media. For more information about Emmaus, please visit Emmaus.edu. Hello and welcome to another episode of Concerning Him, the Emmaus podcast. Today we are joined by Dr. Tim Grass from the Isle of Man. Welcome, Dr. Grass. Good to be with you. It's, it's good to have you. Uh, you are here for three conferences that we're having on campus in a row. The first one, ISI. Second one, the, the Brethren Archivists and Historians Network Conference. And then currently, the Brethren Training Network Conference. And as well as that researching in the Emmaus archives. Absolutely. And you're enjoying that, I assume. When I get a chance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming on. We're happy to have you. And uh, we really are. And, and happy to have somebody that knows history as well as you do, uh, specifically the, the history of the Brethren. Uh -huh. um, let's get started yeah. by having you just tell us who you are. Right. Um, I was born in the east of England and uh, born into a Christian family. Uh, I've never actually belonged to a Brethren Assembly, but I always say that without the Brethren, I wouldn't be here. Uh, in the mid-1950s, uh, there was an assembly uh, in the county of Essex, which is next to London, which used to practice what they called fishing on a Sunday night before the gospel meeting. Basically what happened was that uh, they would go along the cinema queues in the town and tell everybody, look, you don't want to go and see the latest Clark Gable or Shirley Temple or Hedy Lamar or whoever. <laughs> Come to the gospel meeting instead. <laughs> well, my father got fished. He came from an unchurched background. Praise the Lord. Uh, he went to the assembly. Uh, he was converted uh, and met my mother, who was also attending the assembly at that time. They got married, and uh, a few years later, they uh, had me. But by that time, they'd moved on from the Brethren and joined another church. So that's why I say that without the Brethren, I wouldn't he be here because it brought my parents together. <laughs> my father became a an independent Baptist pastor and when I was being brought up that was one of the things I determined I was never going to do when I grew up uh, the Lord had other ideas um, <laughs> I studied theology uh, university and then at what was known as London Bible College now London School of Theology became a pastor in the same denomination as my father had been uh, but during my pastorate I felt drawn to do some postgraduate study. Now I had hated history at school. At the age of 13 I managed to come bottom of my class of 31 pupils and I decided at that point that it really wasn't worth bothering trying to do any exams in the subject. So history was not my topic. But then when I was a little older uh, and in the British educational system, post 16, you get to specialise in a few topics. I chose one of my topics was religious knowledge. That included a section on the history of the early church. And as I encountered this, I got hooked. At that time, I was attending a Pentecostal church. And in fact, that was where I was baptised. In that church, we used to talk about how we were living in the days of the Book of Acts. I therefore grew up with the idea that there was just us and the New Testament and nothing in between. <laughs> Even though we had all sorts of things that in the first century they didn't have, like church buildings, pipe organs and hymnals. Well, as I began to study history, coming from this background where you don't have any sense of history and being useless in the subject at school, to my surprise, I found myself getting completely hooked by it. Fascinated as I read the story of how the early church thrashed out some of the key doctrines that we love 
and Holt too, how it faced all kinds of different pastoral challenges and evangelistic opportunities. And what I think completed the attraction for me was a growing awareness that this was in fact the story of my own family, that I as a Christian had family roots in what I was reading about in the early centuries of the church. So that interest in history was firmly fixed in my mind, but I never had the chance to do much with it until I decided to do postgraduate study. I was a pastor by then. I went to the church deacons and said, I'd like to do this, what do you think? And they said, oh, we're not surprised. We've always thought you'd do something like this, <laughs> which is a bit uncanny when they know something about you that you don't know about yourself. So they released me to be part time as a PhD student at King's College London. And I decided to study the historical development of the doctrine of the church in two 19th century movements. One was the Brethren and the other was the group which grew out of the ministry of the charismatic preacher Edward Irving, known as the Catholic Apostolic Church. Um, if any of you know Chicago, there's uh, a former Catholic Apostolic Church on the Salle, almost opposite Moody Bible Institute. Mm. So I got into this and uh, about the time that I finished my PhD, I concluded my pastorate. I was invited to join Spurgeon's College as an associate uh, tutor. I think you'd probably call it an adjunct and uh, specialise in church history. I've been associated with Spurgeon's now for 25 years, although I'm now uh, a senior research fellow, so I don't have too much to do uh, apart from occasionally examining a PhD thesis for them. So that really is how I came to get hooked on church history. Uh, but maybe my father should have the last word. He's with the Lord now, but on one occasion, in between encouraging me, encouraging me to write the biography of F.F. F. Bruce, which I wrote some years back. He said, you know, your interest in history, he said, it must be a gift of the Holy Spirit because you were useless at history at school. <laughs> uh, with compliments like that, you don't need criticisms, do you? <laughs> Could you take just a minute and tell us about your relationship with uh, Mark Stevenson? Yeah, um, I've obviously continued my interest in Brethren history, uh, written a number of books uh, in that field. And some years ago, I was approached to consider taking Mark on as a doctoral student. Mm. Uh, and I have to say, it was a very fruitful experience for both of us. Uh, I know Mark got a lot out of it. He, in the end, didn't need too much supervising and produced a wonderful book, which I hope you've all seen, uh, The Doctrines of Grace in an Unexpected Place. Um, but uh, I've gained a lot from knowing Mark too. Mm. Well, uh, he speaks very highly of you. He is, at least to me, multiple times he has spoken very highly of you. Right, I'll have to slip him a greenback at some point. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what you call them. One of the things I've been learning this week is the need for simultaneous translation. <laughs> Well, I want to dive into why should uh, Christians and church history? Yeah. And, and, and maybe we could just start there. Why do you believe it is beneficial for Christians, before we get to church history, just broad history in general, why should Christians study history? I would say very simply that we benefit from studying history because that's how we're made as human beings. Uh, we have a sense of our past, present and future. So we live in time and therefore history. And also we have this inbuilt desire to uh, make sense of our lives, to find significance and meaning. I think that's something of what Ecclesiastes was talking about when uh, it speaks of God putting eternity into human hearts. So mm. I think one of the main reasons I would offer is that we are historical creatures. Apart from that, I think that a long view and awareness of past history is extremely important for understanding how society got to be where it is now. 
how we got to be the way we are. And of course, that is very important when it comes to planning for the future. So there, there's all these reasons and plenty more as to why a, a, a general awareness mm -hmm. of history is important. And I think that if you look around today, there is a growing interest in history. You can see, obviously, the interest in family history with websites like Ancestry.com. But you also find there's a market for what you might call popular level books about particular aspects of history, military history or um, railway history, which is a favourite of mine. <laughs> so I think I think there's a, a tide coming in there. I, in the 60s, we, you know, the, the whole counterculture be here now thing, people discounted past history. It's not now. And that left its mark, I think, on the church. But... As we go on, I think we realise that as human beings, we as individuals and the societies that we belong to actually need a sense of our own history. One of the things I appreciated you said just a, a few minutes ago in regard to studying church history is, mm -hmm. is that you said you realised you were a part of a larger family. Yeah. And I was wondering if you could speak into that idea and, and the importance for Christians to to study and to understand and to know church history? Yeah, I think if you want a scripture text on which to base that, it would be the Lord's words, I will build my church. Mm. And he's been doing so for 20 centuries and hasn't finished yet. We are part of God's church alongside Christians at all times and in all places. We know in the book of Revelation, you have this wonderful vision, don't you, of Christians from every tribe and tongue and kindred and nation worshipping the Lamb. Now, that's not just true in terms of eschatology as we look into the future, but it is a fact. Fascinating. I, uh, the, the, if you could speak some about the benefits of what we might call everyday people in church history and because you you are an academic and you're very relatable and i appreciate that but at the end of the day you're a doctor and you 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 spend yeah. your time researching and and there's a lot of people that might say well that's that's great for you that's what you do yeah uh, but i'm a carpenter or i'm a you know i work in insurance or whatever and why should i spend my free time reading biographies reading books about church history what's what's the okay benefit? what's in it for me Absolutely. Yeah. Um, whilst I'm an academic, I find abstract books really hard. They mm. send me to sleep. <laughs> so I have a great deal of sympathy with folk who'd say, I'm not a reader. In fact, when I write my books, I often write with my late father in mind. He left school when he was 15 with no qualifications, but he could think. Mm. Now he could think, but he wasn't used to all the academic ways of expressing yourself and the weird language that academics sometimes use. So history is something that ought to be accessible to everybody, to my mind, just like the gospel is accessible to mm -hmm. everybody. Uh, as for the benefits, I think an awareness of how things have panned out through history, whether it's globally or in our country or even in our city where we live, or our individual congregation. It helps us to get a sense of perspective on where we are now. And that I think is crucially important when we're thinking about how we reach out into our community in the future. So that's one of the reasons I'd give. There are plenty more, but <laughs> the, some of the ones that occur to me just at this moment, I think it inspires humility as we look at some of the people that God has used in the past, and not just the sort of great leaders, but sometimes you find you just fall over stories of an ordinary Christian acting in a way that is profoundly godly. Uh, and you think, would I do that if I was in their situation? Um, I think too that it inspires confidence. This may just be my perspective, but I think there's a lot of panic in the church. And I'm not sure that that's necessarily the best way to uh, react when we look at the situation the world is in. Um, 
because I think that there's a risk that if we panic too much, we forget the promises of God. Mm. Uh, one of the one, the, two that occur to me, the one in 1 John 4 about greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And then the one in 2 Timothy 1 about God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love and of a sound mind. Now, I think history is important to help us get that because as we look at history, we see that actually God has been building his church and sometimes it's had to overcome unimaginable obstacles. That doesn't mean that we have a sort of um, security for you know, the church in our location, come what may. If you look over the course of history, you'll see there's about half a dozen points at which, if you like, the church's centre of gravity, geographically speaking, has shifted. Mm. Uh, the classic example would be if you look in the at the church in North Africa, which in the fourth century was very, very strong. Where is it now? Same can be said for the church in Turkey. Uh, and in our day, we are seeing the church being decimated in countries such as Syria and Iraq. Uh, and of course, you have people prognosticating about how many years it is till the church dies out in Canada or Britain. And yet, even if it does die out in one area, it flourishes in another. Mm. Uh, and that's why, speaking, taking the big view, we can say the Lord is building his church and we can have confidence. You you taught a seminar on this during ISI, which was very yeah. good. And in your seminar, you addressed multiple different objections that people have to studying church yeah. history, which are quite popular in the Brethren movement, especially. <laughs> Not just the Brethren. <laughs> Not just the Brethren, but they are there. If, if yeah. you could maybe address what what are some of those objections and what are your thoughts on them yeah sure um let's begin with the verse of scripture philippians 3 forgetting those things which are past mm. which is one that i've heard and i'm Absolutely. sure some of your listeners have too um i would say look at what paul was telling the philippians to forget it wasn't the past in the sense of past history it was the past in the sense of their pre-conversion outlook on life mm because actually the same person who wrote that went on in several of his letters to ask his readers to observe the tradition that he had handed on to them. So mm -hmm. that's one objection. And I believe that, you know, if you understand what Paul was saying, then it actually loses its force. Um, another would be surely it's just us in the new testament mm -hmm. but the fact is that the way we interpret the new testament is the product of 20 centuries of development of understanding of scripture and of course that uh, as one philosopher has put it those who are ignorant of history are doomed to repeat it um ff F. bruce once commented that where the early church had taken 400 years to run through all the main errors concerning the person and work of Christ, the early brethren managed to do it in 70 precisely because they weren't sufficiently aware of history. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's, that's another objection. Uh, another one might be, there's more important things to do. Well, I, I get the point here and the concern to reach out with the gospel and to give priority to worship is important. But for me, history isn't just about, well, you know, it's Tuesday night, so I'm going to look at history. It's a way that we look at all aspects of life and of church life, that we've just got that historical dimension to our approach. And when you realise that we are made up as historical beings, and that history is about the purposes of God, uh, well, maybe it's a bit more important than we've given it credit for mm. being. Because let's face it, there's an awful lot of history in the Bible, and our faith is founded on historical events. I think that's very helpful. It's very helpful. Okay. Why, why did you first get interested in the Brethren movement specifically? Right. Well, I didn't first get interested in the Brethren <laughs> movement per se. Um, in the 1980s, you had an upsurge of what they called uh, restorationist churches, you know, churches with apostles. Um, 
what in Britain we used to call house churches because they didn't worship in houses, they always worshipped in schools because they quickly got too big for houses. Mm. Now, one of the main roots for the thinking of these churches, which went back to the New Testament, which advocated what they called the Ephesians 4 ministries, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. One of the main uh, sources for their thinking was the Brethren movement, because in Britain, a lot of the leaders of these churches had come out of the Brethren, people like Gerald Coates, who recently went to be with the Lord, and Arthur Wallace, who died about 30 odd years ago. So because I was interested in these uh, restorationist churches as a sort of contemporary phenomenon. I had friends in them. I had relatives in them. I decided that rather than studying the movements themselves, I'd look at their the roots of their thinking. And the brethren, therefore, were something that I got really interested in. So I did my PhD, uh, which, all right, it passed muster as a PhD, but frankly, it was not published, and I'm rather glad it wasn't. <laughs> um, but then some years later, I was thinking about the fact that there was no good uh, up-to-date history of the Brethren. The most recent one in Britain had been written in 1968. By then, it was around 2001 that I was thinking this. And so I pitched my idea to a British publisher, Paternoster, and their director at the time ha was a long-standing member of the Brethren with a real concern for his uh, family, church family. Um, he bit my hand off, and the result was that I ended up writing Gathering to His Name, which is uh, once again available. It will be available in North America. Eric will tell you shortly yes. how you can obtain a copy. Um, and having written that book, the interest just continued because uh, I went on to write the biography of F.F. F. Bruce. Uh, I then wrote a book about Brethren Mission in Spain, uh, uh, a book about a couple of people who are missionaries in Spain under General Franco, which was fascinating because of the persecution that they were working under. And... Uh, the opportunities to write have just continued. Uh, for me, it's a case very much of the Lord opening these doors. And a recent book on, on Brethren Buildings as well. Which oh, I, I forgot that one. Yes, you're yeah. right. Sorry. Yeah, um, I wrote a book which came out last year called Brethren and Their Buildings, which is also available mm -hmm. uh, through Emmaus. Um, I wanted to use the buildings as a way to tell the story of the movement. Mm. Not everybody is going to read my big fat <clears throat> gathering to his name. In fact, uh, a friend's six-year-old son saw his dad open the parcel at the breakfast table and in wide-eyed amazement commented, Daddy, you'll be deadened before you finish reading that <laughs> book. <laughs> well, not everybody's going to read it, and that's fair. That's, that's fine. But I thought a book that has lots of pictures of the buildings because a picture is worth a thousand words, is another way of saying this is what made this movement tick mm. and still does. Uh, so I included lots of pictures of the buildings. Um, I've got a whole chapter on notice boards um, <laughs> because I really must get out less. Um, you know, all the little incidental details. Basically, it's how to read a gospel hall. Mm. And I found it a fascinating project. It started as a sort of almost a hobby and then it became quite serious um, and produced a book that just, you know, slightly surprises me. Where did this come from? But uh, it tells a story and it's aimed not just at church leaders or academics, but at ordinary people mm -hmm. and a number of folk, you know, have bought the book and have have told me, you know, that they found it quite insightful and helpful. Now, it's just UK and Ireland, is that correct? Yeah. Having said that, I'm getting very tempted now that I'm here at Emmaus. <laughs> I think I think someone ought to do one on American buildings. Absolutely. So I, I, I know of a good person that could do it. I think you'd be great. You need to spend a year here with your wife and tour the States and take lots of pictures. I don't think a year would be long enough. All that driving. <laughs> I'd love to see the pictures you'd put in there of the Emmaus building with our stained glass Catholic saints. Well, I haven't put them in there, but I, I must admit, Emmaus is one of the more um, distinctive 
mm. brethren properties. Yeah, interesting. Um, it, it, it's, it's it's an interesting one to visit. But uh, <laughs> there are I mean, in Britain, brethren took over buildings from all sorts of denominations, mm. and you know some of them had stained glass, some of them had spires, mm. um, and I put pictures of some of these in the book. In fact, I I even found one with the little what they call a stoop for holy water by the door. I don't think the brethren use it now. <laughs> Did, I don't know if anybody has told you, but in the marble chapel, uh, when Emmaus bought the building, Jesus was still on the cross. <laughs> the, the big cross up there, so that was, I've heard quite the project. Then you of... have made a sound theological alteration. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious, as we look at the brethren movement, yep. What yep. Is, what's the benefit to studying it or... or how, how do we study the Brother Movement? Well, is there such a thing as the Brethren Movement? That's okay. the other question. All right. But I think you can say that there is a group of local Christian congregations that have certain identifiable similarities, certain characteristics, certain priorities that they share in common. And they just happen to be known by some people as Brethren. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, in, in Britain, we avoid the term Plymouth Brethren because mm. there is a body known as the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, which is obviously very different from Open Brethren. Sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's the benefit of learning from the Brethren? How do we learn from the Brethren? How do we learn? How can we learn? Right. I think we need to be careful. There is a risk of telling any movement story in order to make certain points about how you feel that movement ought to develop today. Mm -hmm. You can see the Brethren story, for instance, as a source of cautionary tales. This is what happens when you take that path, which I happen to disagree with. Mm. And that shows you how bad it is. <laughs> now, that's not an honest approach to history. Yes, there are times when scripture will cite instances uh, as a warning. I mean, a classic example is 1 Corinthians 10. But sometimes... If we look back at Brethren history and we see examples of error or declension or divergence from the truth, we may be selectively reading what happened and we need to make sure that we tell the whole truth mm. and present the whole picture. But that said, I think there is immense value in having an awareness of our history um, or rather your history, because, of course, as I said earlier, I'm not actually in an assembly. Um, I've gone blank. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we need this awareness. It's The Brethren history is not just about fights and squabbles. It often seems like it is. Yeah, but it isn't. And it's the same with church history generally not just about fights and squabbles. And actually, even if you look at those fights and squabbles and you look at what motivated people, you may find things that are admirable and mm. praiseworthy. The fact is that the movement is what it is. And yes, those are part of the story, but they're not the whole story. There is a story of church planting. There is a story of overseas mission because the brethren more than any other protestant movement have sent people into the mission field mm. so you look at this and there may be shady stuff but there's light to balance it and that it seems to me is a very biblical approach if you take for example king david you find that uh, the old testament and the new testament commentators on david are very clear about the light and shade in his life, the sin as well as the the grace and the accomplishments. And yet, with all that, they can say that he was a man after God's own heart. Now, that honest approach to church history, I think is one that we can follow. And I think that if we do that with brethren history, we can see that there is actually stuff there that's worth being aware of and learning about. Mm. Well, I appreciate that. I, uh, <clears throat> I I have not read yet Gathering to His Name. I just purchased it from Mr. Rush two days ago. It's it's in a box in this room, actually. So <laughs> I, I need to grab it um, and, and, and start to read it. I'm very excited for it. 
Um, I have read your your biography of F.F. Bruce, which was very good. Um, not everybody understands his connection to the Brethren. No. Uh, lots of people know him as a commentator, the compiler yeah. of a new international commentary in the New Testament and um, and Old Testament as well, or just the New Testament? I don't New know. Testament. Just New Testament, okay. Um, along with, you know, many other commentaries and, and... But he was always a committed member of Brethren. Yeah. And his thinking about the church was down the line Brethren. He once described himself as a persistent layman. <laughs> Uh, I've taken that to uh, express my own ministry. Um, it's worth explaining that uh, a lot of the books on the Brethren that I write are published through the Brethren Archivists and Historians Network, and they are now available in the UK. In UK, USA. Yes. Yeah, they are available through John Rush yep. of the Emmaus Library. So if you're looking for Gathering to His Name, uh, your book on, on the Brethren and their buildings, um, the the couple the sp the couple that were missionaries in Spain what was their name Ernest and uh, well she was Gertrudis in um, May Trenchard okay yes and that's also available through Mister Rush as the uh, as are other books by Ab the Brethren Archivists and Historians Network absolutely and if you're interested more in the Brethren Archivists and Historians Network it's brethrenhistory.org is that correct that is correct okay yep. and you'll find out how to join and it's possible to pay your subs in USD. Yes, I do every year. I delighted very to hear it, Eric. I pay for it, and then every year I get the journal and I get the most recent book, and it's it's been wonderful. It's a good deal, though I say it myself. <laughs> and I then, get no commission. <laughs> what's if people are interested? What's the best way to get your cop your your a copy of uh, your biography in FF Bruce? Um, it's published in the USA by Erdman's. Okay, so it should be very easy to get. Yes. All right, that is very helpful. Well, thank you very much for coming on today. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Eric. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to Concerning Him, an Emmaus podcast. Ministries like Concerning Him are possible because of the generous contributions from our partners around the world. For more information about partnering with us, please visit emmaus.edu slash partner.